earlier we alluded to the fact that atoms of an element can differ in their numbers of neutrons. And what we call isotopes are atoms of a common element, so they have the same number of protons, that differ in their total mass numbers. So they have equal numbers of protons, but the reason their mass numbers are different is because the numbers of neutrons in the nucleus are different in the two isotopes. And isotopes are very common. We often find elements in nature as mixtures of different isotopes, and multiple isotopes of a particular element can be stable in many cases. So I've included two types of examples on the slide, isotopes of hydrogen and carbon. The most common isotope of hydrogen is what we might call protium, with only a proton in the nucleus and no neutrons. The mass number there is 1, and this is sometimes called 1H. With one proton and one neutron in the nucleus, we have deuterium. And with two neutrons and one proton in the nucleus, we have tritium. All three of these, if we're talking neutral atoms, have one proton and one electron. That defines a neutral hydrogen atom, but they differ in their numbers of neutrons. Among carbon isotopes, carbon-12 is the most common. This has six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-13 has six protons and seven neutrons, and carbon-14, six protons and eight neutrons. And 13 and 14 are less com common than carbon-12, but we can absolutely detect carbon-13 in natural samples of, for example, organic compounds that contain carbon. From my perspective as an organic chemist, the most interesting application of isotopes uh, really has to do with labeling atoms. One of the neat things about isotopes is that they have very similar chemical reactivity. In fact, for our purposes, they have identical chemical reactivity. They behave the same way in chemical reactions. Where they tend to differ, which is beyond our scope for the time being, is in their nuclear chemistry. For example, their radioactivity and things like this. But because they have identical chemical reactivity, we can use different isotopes to label atoms and follow them around by looking for um, experimental or analytical signatures for that isotope. So for example, if I'm running a reaction where water is a reactant, H2O, and I want to figure out where the oxygen in H2O ends up in the final product, well, it's, it's hard to follow around that oxygen unless I set it apart from all other oxygens under the reaction conditions. Maybe there are other oxygens involved in the reactants, for example. In order to set that oxygen apart, I can use oxygen-18 labeled water in the reaction. So H2-18O, or so-called heavy water, this is sometimes called because the oxygen atoms are a little bit heavier than the normal isotope of oxygen. And then I can look for that O18 in the products and figure out then some, some information about how the reaction works on the submicroscopic or molecular level. So isotopic labeling, to me, as an organic chemist, is a very important application of isotopes. Of course, for radiochemists, the radioactive behavior of, of certain isotopes is also very important and a very common application. We can quantify the masses of atoms in different ways. One simple way to quantify the mass of the atom is first of all to understand, if we actually go all the way back to the first slide, that electrons are much, much lighter than protons and neutrons. So the vast majority of mass in the atom comes from the protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And so if we do something similar to what we did with the charge, and we define this mass of the proton and neutron, notice that these are equal, as one what we call atomic mass unit, or AMU, then we can think about the mass of an individual atom as essentially equal to the number, the total number, of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And so we previously called that the mass number. If we ignore the mass of electrons in the atom, which is extremely tiny relative to the mass of protons and neutrons, then we can basically say that the mass number is equal to the atomic mass in atomic mass units. And here we're, we're defining that atomic mass unit as 1 AMU is equal to 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. The number is not important. The thing is we're defining this with reference to the mass of a proton or a neutron, right? And so we can look at, for example, an isotope like carbon-12, 
with six protons and six protons with six protons and six neutrons in the nucleus and conclude immediately that its atomic mass, again, ignoring the electrons because they're so much lighter than the protons and neutrons, is, is 12 AMU. Now, if we took a macroscopic sample of carbon, say charcoal, and measured the masses of the carbon atoms within that macroscopic sample, so containing a massive number of carbon atoms, we wouldn't actually measure the mass of the atom as 12 AMU. We would measure the mass of the atom as 12.011 AMU. And that raises some questions, right? Why in the world does our sample of carbon not have a mass at the atomic level of 12 AMU? Well, the key thing to keep in mind here is isotopes. In a natural sample, of an element, the natural abundances of various isotopes are, are going to be observed. And this creates a situation where the mass we observe at a macroscopic scale, something like Avogadro's number, right, 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms, is going to be an average. The mass that we observe will be an average of the masses of the individual isotopes within the sample. So carbon yeah, in a macroscopic sample is a mixture of carbon-12 and primarily carbon-13. And it's something like 99% carbon-12 and 1% carbon-13. Knowing these abundances, we can actually calculate the average atomic mass of a macroscopic sample using the idea that we can sum the mass of each individual isotope times its abundance as a decimal. So 0 0.99 times 12 plus 0 0.01 times 13, and that's going to get us very close to the observed average atomic mass that we see, which is this 12.011 AMU. So the average atomic mass is generally what we'll use if we're thinking about chemical species on the macroscopic level, which is going to be very common for us moving forward. And for example, on the periodic table, you will see these average atomic masses listed with the understanding that we're talking about a sample in nature with the natural abundance of various isotopes found on Earth. It's worth taking a moment now to talk a little bit about how we know that isotopes exist and how they manifest themselves in various types of measurements. And one of the most straightforward ways that we see isotopes involves the use of a technique called mass spectrometry. And this is essentially a way to measure the masses of atoms or molecules within a sample. The way it works has to do with the fact that heavier atoms or molecules are harder to deflect along a path, and the use of ionization to induce a charge in atoms and molecules followed by electric fields or magnets to deflect those charged particles. So in a mass spectrometer, the sample comes in, there is an electron beam source or some other mechanism to ionize the sample. The ions are accelerated through some plates via an electric field between the two plates, and then there's a magnet here at the bend that veers the ions kind of off their straight course. And the extent to which they bend depends on their mass. So the lightest ions, which will show up here, get bent the most. And the heaviest ions, which show up here, get bent the least. Based on this ideal, where the ions show up on the detector tells us about their mass and a computer analyzes the detector output and it converts it essentially into a graph of actually the mass to charge ratio. So this is the ratio of the mass of the ion to its charge. Plus one or minus one is normal and so z is typically plus or minus one. And um, assuming that all the charges are plus or minus one, which is fine for us for the time being, the y-axis tells us about the relative abundance of that atomic or molecular mass. So here, for example, imagine we had a sample of zirconium atoms coming in. Zirconium has the symbol ZR. Ionization and then deflection 
and we get this graph of the relative abundances of the elements. So the vast majority of zirconium is relatively light, zirconium 90, remember that 90 is the mass number, with smaller amounts of zirconium 91, 92, 94, and 96. And the mass of zirconium that we would observe if we were to work with that sample, again, a macroscopic sample, say one gram or 10 grams of it, would be a weighted average of these isotopic mass numbers where the weights are the relative abundances. So something like about 0.5 times 90 plus about 0.1 times 91, 0.2 times 92, 0.2 times 94, and maybe 0.05 times 96, where of course all the abundances would have to add up to 100% uh, or, or 